Hi, this is John Linneball, and this is AP U.S. History, video 36, American Culture Develops in the First Half of the 1800s. And if you like this video, please don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe, because that really helps me out. It helps me get mo money without you giving me yo money. Okay. New Developments in American Religion and Spirituality. Political, cultural, economic, and demographic changes led to a second Great Awakening. So there was the first Great Awakening about 100 years before this, and this is the second one. So this religious-slash-spiritual awakening led to several religious and reform movements. The second Great Awakening. In the first half of the 1800s, religious leaders wanted to revive religious feeling in Americans, much like the Great Awakening about 100 years before, so in the early 1700s. Clergy were worried that Americans were more concerned with politics and religion. Camp meetings in Kentucky revived religious sentiment and caught on in western New York and western Pennsylvania. Many growing towns along the Erie Canal were called burned over towns because they'd been reached with the fire of religious revival. So they were on fire with religious revival. And here we have a nice little model of an Erie Canal town with a model of the locks and the Erie Canal barge and everything, so it's very cute. Let's move on. More Second Great Awakening. Merchants, farmers, artisans, and others were brought into greater U.S. society by the market revolution, and they were very ready to hear this religious message. The market, in quotes, gospel and the Second Great Awakening actually had the same message. That was individual religious salvation or earthly success was through hard work, persistence, morality, and self-control. So you might think, like I did the first time I read this, oh, that's just like Calvinism. Yeah, because that's what the Puritans believe, right? So it's, it's very Calvinist. No, it's not. The reason is because Calvinism taught predestination, so salvation could not be earned through hard work. You were already saved, basically, by the time you were born, God already knew whether you were going to be saved or not, apparently. So, business success was merely a sign that you were already predestined for heaven. It wasn't that you were going to get into heaven by succeeding in business. Not just individual redemption, but societal redemption could be had through reform. This idea led to reform movements. Mormonism. Mormonism was started near Syracuse, New York, if my memory serves. It's Hill Cumorah. They have the Hill Cumorah pageant. Anyway, it was started near Syracuse, New York by Joseph Smith in 1830 as a result of the Second Great Awakening. This was called the Church of Latter-day Saints, or LDS. Mormonism, like some other sects, separated itself from others, starting isolated communities of its adherents. Mainstream Protestant sects disliked and mocked Mormonism, calling Mormon beliefs ridiculous fantasies. Ha! Huh, maybe they call it LSD instead of LDS. Ha ha. Just kidding. Anyway. Others criticized Mormonism for its apparent rejection of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, as you would guess a new religion is going to be heavily criticized by the older, more established religions. Mormonism continued. So one controversial practice of Mormonism is polygamy, men having multiple wives. It was officially, officially renounced by the LDS, but it's still practiced in certain Mormon communities that are usually pretty isolated, so nobody's really going to be there to tell them what to do. And this was portrayed in HBO's fictional Big Love series about, eh, about 10, 20 years ago. So you can look that up on Netflix if you'd like to see that. Mitt Romney's ancestor moved to Mexico to practice polygamy as a Mormon. His father was born there. If you don't believe me, you can see the Romney's Mexican History, Travel Smithsonian Magazine, and I've already pulled this up in this web browser, so you can see that all right, Mitt Romney's father was born in a small Mormon enclave where family members still live, surrounded by, violent, by rugged beauty and violent drug cartels, and it talks about how they're in northern Chihuahua, you know, Mitt Romney has family roots in Mexico, and not just any part of Mexico, but in a place famous for producing true hombres, a rural, a rural frontier where thousands of Mormons still live and where settling differences at the point of a gun has been a tragically resilient tradition. So, and then Northern Chihuahua is being ravaged by the so-called cartel drug wars making Ciudad Juarez 
the most notoriously dangerous city in the Western Hemisphere. hemisphere. Murder City, the writer Charles Bowden called it in his most recent book. So we can see that about Mitt Romney's father. Mitt Romney, of course, the unsuccessful Republican president. <laughs> unsuccessful candidate for president. Having a little trouble talking. Sorry about that. Okay, Mormonism. Mormons moved from upstate New York and Syracuse to Ohio, then to Missouri, then to Illinois. Joseph Smith was killed by an anti-Mormon mob at Carthage, Illinois, near Nauvoo, Illinois, where the Mormons had settled. They basically bought the town of Commerce and renamed it Nauvoo. Commerce was a little town that was you know, not too hard to buy up. 1844. The new leader, Brigham Young, led Mormons to Utah in 1847. So history repeats itself. You can see the antelope slash Rajneesh Puram incident from the early 1980s, which I remember from being a kid in the early 1980s and watching the news. So here's a little website on that. This is OK, OK Freedom. This program that I need to uninstall is trying to unblock this content, which is weird because it's not blocked if I put it in like this. So here we go. Anyway. This is the Rajneesh movement. This is somebody who took over the little town of Antelope by buying everything out and basically taking over the school board, etc. And all right, let's get rid of this. Yeah. Da, da, da. All right, get rid of that OK freedom. It's OK annoying. Anyway. So Antelope was a town with a population of 50 in size of less than a square mile. So they took over all the land around it. And okay, Bhagwan on the Rajneesh, about 20 miles away, built a utopian city. They transformed an empty ranch into a massive commune. And so then basically that became that person's religious retreat until what happened with that is had somebody, well, they had some things where basically they wanted to poison people who were running for office, you know, to get, not to kill them, but to get them sick. So you know, people wouldn't be able to vote in the election and things like that. So they, I am not making this up. They basically wanted to poison, you know, salad bars and things like that. So people would get sick and be unable to vote. Anyway, that's worth watching. It's a Netflix documentary. I'm not sure if it's still available, but this is only a few years old, called Wild Wild Country. So it's interesting to see how history repeats itself sometimes. But getting back to what I'm discussing here. All right, we have Mormonism. History is political, so stories, or his stories, ha ha ha, very. Uh, so... And if you're wondering, no, the etymology of the word history is not actually from his story. So, but it still is pretty funny when women talking about feminist history, etc. call it, no, it's her story. Ha! Huh. I have a good sense of humor, so that's pretty funny. But anyway, so history is political, so histories vary. In a society that values religious freedom, schools and textbooks are going to avoid anything that even appears to criticize any religion. And then the same goes for race, gender, patriotic views, etc. Nobody's going to criticize somebody based on their race, gender, religion, uh, patriotic views. The people who influence school boards the most pretty much throughout the whole United States are going to be people like veterans of foreign wars, things like that, who are very conservative, very patriotic, really don't want to see anything on public school curricula that isn't the United States is the best country in the world. And yeah, while it's made a few minor mistakes, it's still really awesome. And, you know, it's going to gloss over a lot of awful things the United States did, etc. Um, and the same thing goes for things like religion. So I'm about to say some things that aren't very nice about the Mormon religion. I'm not making fun of them or picking on them any more than people who are picking on, you know, the Catholic sex abuse scandals or various other things or things that I can show you about the Catholic Church that we t discussed in earlier videos about colonization and the Native American schools, etc. So if you think I'm picking on your religion, I'm not, but facts are facts. Anyway, so even if you're trying to avoid the appearance of bias, if you're leaving out important facts, you're leaving out important facts. Glossing over uncomfortable facts just isn't really a good idea. And so you might say, well, geez, how can school districts do that? I mean, but my free speech, you know, First Amendment, John, I know all about that. The government can't censor speech. 
Um, right, they can't, but the school, you know, as a publisher, as a disseminator of information, does not have to include everything. One, because you couldn't include literally everything that was relevant or every everything that could possibly be relevant. So they're going to say, we have to pick and choose. This is what we picked and chose. And by the way, as a school district, we have free speech right. The publishers of these books also have free speech rights. So anyway, just telling you as in a very long winded way, get online and go to the library. If you see something that doesn't make sense or they don't go into very much detail, look it up on Wikipedia really quickly, go to the library, look up some actual paper books. You'll find some really interesting things. The whole truth is much more interesting than what they teach you in school. Okay, so the mob attack that we've talked about, and it's really in the AP U.S. History Barron's book that I use for as the main source for most of these videos. It just says, oh, an anti-Mormon mob attacked Joseph Smith. That's absolutely true, but there was a reason for the mob attack. The attacks at Carthage and Nauvoo led to the LDS leading, <laughs> sorry, not leading, leaving, although today the LDS and the Community of Christ or the Reformed Church of Latter-day Saints own most of the landmarks in Nauvoo. So if you look up Nauvoo, Illinois, and Wikipedia, you can see that. Anyway, the attack at Carthage was precipitated by Joseph Smith's order that the press and all printed copies of the Nauvoo Expositor, a newspaper published by William Law, who'd been excommunicated from the Mormons and had started the true Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, be destroyed. The Smith and his brother were jailed as a result and then assassinated by an angry mob that attacked the jail. So it was very old-school, Wild West-type lynching that you see in movies. This was about the time that those things were going on for real, and this was one of them. So it's not quite what they put in the book or what you would take away from the book. Just, you know, it's strongly implied that, oh my God, these poor people were just trying to practice their religion peacefully, and they got attacked by these angry mobs. Mm, not quite. So it's always a good idea to actually read these things and find out what's really going on, such as by going to this Nauvoo, Illinois Wikipedia site. You can go here, so, you know, the history of Nauvoo <clears throat> and the violence caused, you know, you can go and look here to Brigham Young, you can, da, 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 Joseph Smith's death, so, okay, you could go to here, and da, 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 da. you know, so his death. Well, okay, William Law, Smith's trusted counselor, and Robert Foster, a general in the Nauvoo Legion, disagreed with Smith about how to manage Nauvoo's economy, and both also said that Smith had proposed marriage to their wives. Hmm. So there were a lot of things that really happened here. You know, the dissidents published the first and only issue of the Nauvoo Expositor. And then, so, all right, yeah. And the Nauvoo City Council declared the expositor a public nuisance and ordered the Nauvoo Legion to de destroy the press. So, feared another mob attack supported the action, not realizing that destroying a newspaper was more likely to incite an attack than any libel. So, these were problems, basically, okay. You know, Governor Thomas Ford appeared, okay, Car officials in Carthage responded by mobilizing their small detachment of the state militia, and Governor Thomas Ford appeared, threatening to raise a larger militia unless Smith and the Nauvoo City Council surrendered themselves. So, you can see what happened there. Basically, the Mormons got themselves in some trouble, or really I should say Joseph Smith got himself in some trouble by destroying a newspaper, which is very, very un-American. Again, not picking on the Mormons, but that's what we're discussing here, and that's a problem. And this, of course, led to the Mormons, through Brigham Young, etc., moving to Utah. Now, Mormonism and slavery. This is really interesting because the Mormons were actually the good guys here, or they're trying. The intentions were really, really good. It's that, you know, the Mormons tried to stop native child slavery in Utah. They ended up encouraging it. So this is from the History Channel, which is great. I love seeing things from the History Channel that aren't things like Honey Boo Boo or 
pawn shop or things like that. I mean, those, you know, pawn shops entertaining, but it's you know, kind of only vaguely history related and things like Honey Boo Boo, etc. You know, why is that even on the History Channel? Or if I've got that wrong, I apologize. But anyway. Mormons tried to stop native child slavery in Utah. They ended up encouraging it. So the basic gist of it is, is that if you go here, you can see that while slavery was technically illegal, it was big business, and Mexican colonists in the area enslaved native people and used their work to work their lands and tend their children. And some Native Americans would do that as well because they would raid nearby tribes, capturing potential slaves and selling them to the Mexican elite. They also stole horses and sold them. And also they positioned themselves as slave traders, not potential slaves themselves. So basically they became slavers, so they wouldn't actually become slaves. That seemed to be seemed to make sense to them as, hey, we'll get you slaves, so don't enslave us. Anyway, so the good intentions were the Mormons really were working to end slavery. They would buy these enslaved children to rescue, civilize, you know, that is convert them to Mormonism, to the you know, LDS, and free them. But they ended up encouraging more child slavery. So you can think of the hostage problem. If you don't know what I mean by the hostage problem, what I mean is if you negotiate with terrorists who take hostages and you give them what they want, you're encouraging them to take more hostages when they want something else and don't have another way to get it. So, or even if they do have another way to get it, but they don't feel like doing it because taking the hostages is easier. So anyway, the Utah economy relied on Native American and black indentured servitude, but black slaves were treated worse according to the History Channel webpage cited above. So we can basically find that here. And yeah, they weren't the only slaves. Three black slaves came along and the same paternalistic attitudes that drove uh, indigenous slavery among the Mormons were applied to black slaves, but okay. So Native American slaves were in quotes indentured for 20 years. Black slaves were until they could satisfy the debt their master had incurred to purchase them. And okay, the double standard black slaves were handled more harshly than Native American ones. So that's that is what it is there was a teaching in the mormon church for a while that blacks were the sons of cain and they were being punished by having black skin again not making this up i don't believe the modern church of latter-day saints actually believes that it's not part of their doctrine but that probably was also part of why black slaves were treated differently if i'm wrong please let me know anyway so that's what we have here. So the Ute tribe, as I said before, sold slaves captured from other tribes to ensure they, the Utes themselves, wouldn't be enslaved. The problem is, as the Ute economy suffered, as you can read in that article, many Utes sold their children so they and their other children, etc., could survive. Another movement in the United States was transcendentalism at that time. You've probably heard of Henry David Thoreau, Walden Pond, all that. So transcendentalism was a reaction to slash protest of materialism in 1800s US. Henry David Thoreau wrote Walden. You've probably heard of it. I admit I've heard of it. I haven't read the thing. Should, but haven't read it yet. On disobedience to civil government. Again, I know of it, but haven't really read it. Anyway. He lived at Walden Pond from 1845 to 1847, and he was arrested by the local tax collector for delinquent poll taxes, which would later become illegal as unconstitutional because it was used to keep people from voting who otherwise were qualified to vote. And of course, it's going to be used in a discriminatory way because laws like that always are, it seems. Anyway, but getting back to this point, um, so, he spent two days in jail until someone, likely his aunt, paid them against his wishes. So according to Wikipedia, in January and February of 1848, he delivered lectures on the rights and duties of the individual in relation to government, which later became on disobedience to civil government or civil disobedience. Oops, I should have capitalized that R. Oh well, we'll get over it. Transcendentalism, Ralph Waldo Emerson and communes. So Ralph Waldo Emerson, another very famous transcendentalist, 
wrote several essays, including On Self-Reliance in 1841. He was friends with Thoreau. His journal, published in 16 volumes by Harvard University Press, is often considered his chief literary work. While transcendentalists were critical of mainstream society, they generally weren't part of reform movements. Transcendentalists often withdrew from society and several created communes that lived separately from society. So do you see the same idea coming up again and again and again? Hey, we've got a great idea, but rather than trying to reform society in general, we're going to go and live on our little commune and be separate from this awful, sinful society. And you could even see that in the early 1990s with the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, but unfortunately they were hoarding guns and... That ended very, very badly for them. The, I believe the BATF and Department of Justice, a lot of yeah, U.S. government officials came and ended their commune rather violently. I'm not, sure, I'm not commenting on whether that should have happened or didn't, but just my advice to you, if you decide to follow the advice of the Transcendentalists and start your own commune, don't stockpile weapons. Okay. Communes slash utopian communities. Utopian communities were groups of people who lived together or communally organized around a central principle. Similarly to transcendentalism, these communities disliked the materialism of mainstream society. While transcendentalism focused on the self, you can think Walden, utopian communities focused on improved societies, group living, etc. Although, as we saw before, there was some overlap between them and some transcendentalists did actually go off and form utopian communities. Brook Farm started outside Boston in 1841 in present-day West Roxbury, Massachusetts by George Ripley was based on the idea that all people would share work and leisure equally. Believe it or not, I have no idea if George Ripley is related to the Ripley of Ripley's Believe It or Not, but I think it's kind of funny. And in case you're wondering, Ripley's Believe It or Not, comic strip that was in the Sunday comics when I was a kid, and I know they have Ripley's Believe It or Not museums in a lot of major cities. So I would have things like this, like James Monroe, elected U.S. president in 1820, is the only president of the United States, apart from George Washington, to have been elected unopposed. Remember the era of good feeling where there was no meaningful opposition to the dominant party? Well, here you go. Led to things like James Monroe. Heroin was originally a brand name by, trademarked by drug company Bayer in 1898 and sold as cough medicine. And fortune cookies were invented in California, not China. So that was interesting. Anyway, communes slash utopian communities continued. Brook Farm members saw leisure as good and necessary, unlike most people of the anti, not anti, anti-bellum pre-Civil War period. Nathaniel Hawthorne, the author of The Scarlet Letter, was one of the original participants at Brook Farm, but became disillusioned and left. Brook Farm was an inspiration to Charles Fourier, the French socialist who has been credited, at least by some, with inventing the term feminism, and Robert Owen, a Scottish industrialist and philanthropist. In 1825, Owen formed the New Hope Commune in Indiana, and its main principle was total equality. Brook Farm failed, but George Ripley managed to rebound and die as a wealthy man. Developments in Native American spirituality. So Native Americans, having been defeated in war, exposed to new diseases, dispossessed and displaced, combined their traditional religion with elements of outside religion, including Christianity. The Iroquois Confederacy was defeated, but a Seneca named Handsome Lake developed a religion from traditional Native American and Quaker practices called the Longhouse religion. Remember the Iroquois, Haudenosaunee, that means people of the Longhouse. You can see video 12 for more information about the Iroquois. And this is the patch from the Order of the Arrow uh, unit that I belonged to when I was in the Boy Scouts a long time ago. It was Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. Handsome Lake was opposed by native traditionalists and Christian missionaries, but he offered hope to the Iroquois, rallied against alcohol consumption and the disintegration of the Native American family, so definitely re revitalized Native Americans and got them active in the ways that he could. A national culture appears. Webster's Dictionary, the thing that came up with the official American English spellings and pronunciations of different words 
and Webster and Jedediah Morse's school books, etc. You can see video 29 for a little bit more on that. That definitely helped create a separate American culture that was separate from British culture. And there was increased Americanism, American patriotism, after the War of 1812. So you can think of the Star Spangled Banner. You know, that's the national anthem of the United States. It was written by Francis Scott Key after he observed the bombardment of Fort McHenry by the British Navy during the Battle of Baltimore in 1814. Notice that that flag at that time had actually 15 stripes and 15 stars because the practice at that point was as a new state was added, a new star and a new stripe would be added until they realized this flag is going to be awfully big if we keep doing that, so they stopped doing that. Anyway, American Renaissance. So we had Herman Melville, who's this guy down in the lower right hand corner. He wrote Moby Dick, 1851, which was a seminal novel about a captain's pursuit of a whale. Definitely one of those writers that even if you haven't read his works, you've read about them, you know of them, so he definitely was someone who would lead to many other works being written, thus the, the comment a seminal novel. Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass. Okay, this is Walt Whitman, very famous poetry book. Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter, 1850. You probably had to read this for English. And The House of Seven Gables, 1851. So these all address the Puritan legacy, Massachusetts, etc., and the creation of democracy in the New World. And Leaves of Grass also figures into one of my favorite TV shows, as we'll see here. To W.W., -W, my star, my perfect silence. W.W. <laughs> <W. laughs> I mean, you figure that is, yeah. Walter White. European Romanticism and American Culture. Romanticism was a thought style that came from Europe and it was popular in Europe and the United States in the first half of the 1800s. It was a reaction to industrialization, so it idealized a simpler past. Noble savages, agrarianism, oh, isn't it nice to have this wonderful pastoral countryside, etc. The Hudson River School, developed in the United States, while European romantics like to paint ruins of castles and things like that, very kind of Dungeons and Dragons looking things. Uh, these things weren't in the United States. There simply weren't any ruins of castles because no castles had been built. So the U.S. counterparts painted pristine wilderness and things like that, and you know, very rugged log cabins and things like that. So after the Erie Canal opened, the Hudson River got more attention. Paintings of wilderness, etc., by that river became very popular. So the most famous painters of the Hudson River School from the 1820s to the 1870s were Thomas Cole, Asher Durand, and Frederick Church. So this is an example of a Thomas Cole painting. So you can see the little rowboat and the guy who's been fishing and the woods and the log cabin and everything. And yeah, it's a very pretty painting and shows a kind of very bucolic rural scene here. European Romanticism and American culture continued. Asher Durand's Okay, very similar painting. Here's kind of a rugged looking guy. I don't know what he's carrying, a bagpipe or something. I don't know. And, you know, you can see, okay, there's a church in the background, but mostly it's these very nice trees and a pond and things like that. So it's very rural and very pretty. And then Frederick Church painting here. That's a pretty amazing sunset. And we can see all these trees and mountains and clouds. And, you know, so it's very relaxing pastoral images. Romanticism in American Literature. James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote the Leatherstocking Tales, including The Last of the Mohicans in 1826. These were the fictional adventures of a frontiersman named Natty Bumpo, also known as Leatherstocking, Deerslayer, and Hawkeye in different stories. And yes, that's where Hawkeye Pierce from the old MASH TV series and movie got his name. And it presented the past frontier experience. So here we have a little 
New York State historical marker here saying Natty Bumpo, David Shipman, circa 1729 to 1813. This is a burial site of a local hunter known by an inspiration for James Fenimore Cooper's literary character. So I guess that was the real life Natty Bumpo, so to speak. And that's where he died and was buried. So Washington Irving wrote less serious tales or more fanciful, such as Rip Van Winkle, 1819, you know, the guy who fell asleep for 20 years, and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, you know, the Headless Horseman story. And they've done TV shows and things like that based on that and whatever, movies, cartoons. Anyway, African American culture, free and slave, David Walker. African American culture was meant to preserve dignity in the face of undignified slavery. David Walker wrote David Walker's Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World in 1829. And here we have the title page of a copy that was printed probably in Massachusetts. It says it was written in Boston in the state of Massachusetts on September 28, 1829. And okay, it also comes with a preamble, an appeal in four articles. So there it is. As you may have guessed, this encouraged people of African descent worldwide to oppose slavery. And you may have also guessed that Southern slave owners considered this pamphlet to be seditious. So its publication was considered to be a form of sedition or treason. You know, you're rebelling against the government if you're rebelling against an official practice. So laws were enacted to publish those who, not to publish, to punish those who published it. Maybe they'll publish that you got punished as well. But anyway, so it was enacted to punish those who published it. Frederick Douglass. He was a major abolitionist figure, born into slavery in 1818, and he fled to freedom in 1838. His book about his experience, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, was a bestseller. There's a passage from it that's used in the SAT book that I use for my SAT students, and it's quite good. He addressed the Rochester, New York Anti-Slavery Sewing Society with what is the slave, or sorry, what to the slave is the 4th of July. It's a speech that detailed the inherent irony of asking slaves to celebrate the freedom of their owners when they're not free, they're being owned, they're slaves. So, like, great freedom there, guys. Okay, anyway. Douglas did advise President Lincoln regarding the emancipation of slaves, the treatment of black Union soldiers, and remained a very important figure in race relations, etc., until his death in 1895. So he lived a good long time. The African Methodist Episcopal, or AME, Church. African Americans developed religious beliefs to match their experiences. The AME Church was formed in Philadelphia in 1816 by Richard Allen by combining several African American Methodist churches. <laughs> churches. Anyway, while the mainstream Methodist Church was anti-slavery, as expressed by the anti-slavery preaching of its founder, John Wesley, and... The AME incorporated ma many mainstream Methodist practices. The AME did establish a faith for African Americans with a distinctly racial theology, which makes perfect sense if you think about it. Resisting slavery through culture. Slaves found ways to resist their harsh treatment through subtle cultural expressions that gave them rest, cheer, and hope, but didn't put them in danger of being severely punished or killed. So, Br'er Rabbit stories. Stories where a weaker person outsmarts a stronger one. So, for example, the most famous one, or at least the one I know, is, Don't throw me into the briar patch! You know, the, the rabbit saying this to the wolf. See, little briars, don't, whatever you do, don't throw me into the briar patch. So, the wolf, who's strong, but maybe not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree, says, Oh, I know, I'm going to throw you into the briar patch! And chucks him into the briar patch. And the rabbit happily runs away saying, I was born in a briar patch! So, you know. He got away, outsmarted that wolf. Or the. F anyway. The music. Slaves created instruments from items such as gourds, horsehair, etc., made a little guitar or something like that. And they combined African rhythms and European melodies, which you see today in blues, jazz, rock. Pretty much all the distinctly American forms of music came from things like this, where African and European elements of music were put together to form a uniquely, <clears throat> excuse me, uniquely American music, such as jazz, blues, rock. 
Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why? Well, it's simple. YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours or 240,000 minutes of view time in a year. While many people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time. I also don't have a thousand subscribers at this time, although I'm getting very close. Ad money will help me make more videos. If you saw an ad during this video, please know I did not get any of the money from that, and I won't until I have the subscribers and view time YouTube demands. For the same reason, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I gladly read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. I also don't really care to hear destructive criticism or suggestions that are not very nice. So I reserve the right to delete comments such as troll posts or spam. You can also hire me for tutoring. I can tutor you in person if you are in or close to the San Francisco Bay Area or we make other arrangements. I can always tutor you online if you have an online connection and if you don't have an online connection, how are you watching this video? Thanks for watching and my contact information follows. Contact me, Facebook, Instagram, email, phone. Okay, Facebook, you can see it here, facebook.com forward slash Linneval Tutoring, Instagram forward slash John dot Linneval dot Tutoring. My phone number is 415-623-4251. That's my cell phone. If you want to send me a text message, that's great too. John at JohnLinneval.com is my email. And the website, www.JohnLinneval.com, www.JohnLinevalTutoring.com. Both take you to the same website. TestPreparation.Locals.com. I have a Locals.com site. It doesn't have ads. It costs a little bit to subscribe to it. Anyway, you can check it out. Also, I have lbry.tv, and I'm at John Linneval Tutoring. That's another thing you can check out if you don't want to look at these things on YouTube. Mail. You can mail me at John Linneval Tutoring, 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. Finally, note, this is not a substitute for your classes, text, etc., this video is based on the Barron's AP United States History Review Book and the other sources listed in the video description on my general knowledge of U.S. history. While this should help you do well on the AP U.S. History exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and ask you about his or her own test, you know, on or in his or her own tests, homework, etc. <clears throat> so, please read your class texts and pay attention to what your teacher says in class. With that, I'm out. Have a nice day.